Hello, my name is Mika Scow. I am presenting on the politics of matcha, tracing the transculturation of Japanese tangible heritage in the United States. My professor advisors are Joe Lowndes and Anna Carroll. This project contextualizes the transculturation of matcha green tea, a culturally significant Japanese product within the landscape of the American market. Right. Since Starbucks' inclusion of matcha on its menu in 2005, the Japanese beverage has become increasingly common in the United States. Now served in most coffee shops, matcha has earned its place as a hot commodity among American consumers. Now, in the present, matcha is widely available as a beverage, ingredient, and supplement across the United States. It is sold in supermarkets, through e-commerce, um, and in restaurants. It is commonly sweetened with vanilla and sugar, and since it also has nutritious elements, it is sold as a supplement, detox, or a caffeine substitute at gyms and fitness studios. But before its time as a trending product in the United States, matcha green tea had a very different appearance. As a significant Japanese cultural artifact, matcha has transformed within the American market. It has become a product separate from its traditional Japanese form. In light of this, my research asks, how does the commodification of Japanese matcha in the American market, as exemplified by Starbucks, Chamberlain Coffee, and various online superfood brands, affect the identity and heritage of Japanese Americans? And you might ask, why the heritage and identity of Japanese Americans? Well, losing ties with significant cultural artifacts like matcha is damaging to Japanese American identity because it contributes to the consequential cultural separation that comes with Asian diaspora. A 2022 Pew Research study titled what it means to be Asian in America, found that Asian Americans, quote, identify themselves based on their familiarity with their own heritage, quote, and those who are not familiar with their family's heritage showed less connection with their ethnic ties. These findings suggest that Asian Americans must maintain ties to their heritage in order to connect with their ethnic identity. This is also why Issei and Nisei, meaning first and second generation Japanese Americans, tend to have stronger ties to their Japanese identity in contrast to Sansei or Yonsei, meaning third or fourth generation Japanese Americans. Nonetheless, this research addresses an extension of these findings, which is that the reduction of matcha, a tangible cultural heritage, to a product shrinks the realm in which Japanese Americans can connect to their cultural identity through heritage in the first place. The danger of commodifying Japanese cultural artifacts for American consumers is that its cultural appropriation and transculturation will diminish the presence of Japanese heritage in the United States over time. Therefore, this research is important for the purpose of Japanese American studies and maybe Asian studies in general. This research follows a deductive approach and um, the methodology goes as follows. It starts with a theory, history, then current literature, case study, and last conclusion. To start with my theories, there are three that I highlight in this project. The first is hybridity, meaning cross-cultural exchange. Hybridity points out that when two cultures collide, the outcome is a sort of hybrid culture. The problem with this theory is that it was first used in colonial literature when referring to the cultural interactions between indigenous people and white Europeans. Um, this is problematic in that the hybrid culture um, tends to be celebrated in colonial literature and it ceases to mention the problematic nature of this kind of cultural merging. Um, it does not acknowledge the power that is involved. Um, so that brings me to the second theory, cultural appropriation, which does acknowledge this problem. It concerns the nature of when 
cultural artifacts and ideas are taken without accreditation of the source culture. And so the purpose of this theory is to make sense of that power dynamic that exists. It's to establish that a taking can happen to, um, to a group that is more vulnerable than another. Lastly, there is the theory transculturation, which describes the complex process of domination and loss that occurs between two emerging cultures. This involves um, the gradual transforming, diminishing, and creation of culture. Um, I interpret transculturation as an extension of cultural appropriation and a full and better substitute to hybridity. For historical review, I will highlight these three points. The signing of the Kanagawa Treaty in 1854, the Japanese surrender of World War II in 1945, and the bubble economy from 1986 to 1992. And this will help provide context of how matcha got to the United States today. So, to start from the beginning with the Kanagawa Treaty, Japan is opened to the Western world by the power of American guns and ships. This results in booming demand for Japanese exports among Europeans, especially Parisians, and so much so that the French word Japanisme was coined, meaning Japanese obsession, um, the word that was used to describe um, people who collected Japanese things, garbs, art, poetry, and so, so on and so forth. Um, despite being in a unfortunate circumstance, Japan took advantage of this opening to the West and actually profited a lot right off the bat from these cultural exports to France and greater Europe. Um, in World War II, Japan is occupied by America from 1945 to 1952, and the war greatly impacts how American consumers view Japanese products. There is a stigma against them. Um, so this results in the post-war era um, Japanese exports being primarily of manufacturing and technological exports. Um, this is really sneaky, and they... It, these exports blend into the American landscape in a way that um, they are not recognizably Japanese products. Um, they just seem to be products that are helpful and um, ease, ease the Japanese image back into the United States without looking explicitly Japanese. Um, the manufacturing and technology export economy really helped um, the post-war Japanese economy so much so that the bubble economy became a thing. I will not go into explaining what the bubble economy is for the sake of this conversation, but upon the popping of this economy, um, Japan made an emergency policy pivot, which was designed to promote cultural exports, and grow the tourist economy. So as you can see, um, over here in the first one with the Kanagawa Treaty, the exports are cultural exports, but then um, in the post-war era, they revert back to um, manufacturing and technology and cannot um, profit off of this Japanese target audience any longer. But 40 years after the war, um, 1992, um, the Japanese government is thinking the war is over and we have a market for Japanese smith. Uh, why don't we profit off that again? And thus, um, traditional cultural exports um, return around the world in an aim to grow the tourist economy. So, let's talk a little bit more about the Japan brand. Um, once again, it was this policy to recover the bubble economy and promote Japanese cultural ex exports. Um, and 
they ensure that these exports are recognized as Japanese products abroad. So that includes products such as matcha or even fresh sushi and the culinary tools that are required for them and the sacred methods that are used to prepare the sushi. All of those things can be considered cultural exports. Um, the aim is to increase the export economy as well as inbound tourism as these products spread around the globe um, and they're recognizably Japanese, people will associate that with them and think, I cannot get this anywhere but Japan. It cannot be rec replicated anywhere but Japan and therefore I must visit Japan. Um, that, in a nutshell, is what the aim of the Japan brand is. Another aspect of the Japan brand is that it recognized washoku, uh, meaning traditional Japanese food, as a UNESCO tangible heritage, um, <clears throat> therefore allowing them to launch more programs promoting such things. So that is how matcha got to the United States and how it became so widespread. Um, the case studies that I chose, Starbucks and Tazo, Chamberlain Coffee, and Superfood Brands, are examples of how matcha started as a cultural artifact and were transformed into something new. They were transculturated. Um, so Starbucks and Tazo started in 1999 when Starbucks purchased Hazo, a tea company by a, a white Portland entrepreneur guy, Stephen Smith. Um, this made way for Tazo branded green tea lattes and the Starbucks trademark Frappuccino beverage. Um, Starbucks matcha mixtures easily mixes with water and its primary ingredient is sugar. It is mixed with vanilla flavoring and Starbucks does not reveal who its matcha supplier is. Um, this is very unlike the traditional form of matcha. Um, tea ceremony matcha cannot be mixed so easily. It has to be frothed and whisked carefully in order to mix with water. Um, it is not sweetened and the most important part is to savor the bitterness and natural sweetness of matcha tea leaves. So, this is the first instance of transculturated matcha in the United States. Now, this was a hit, and um, as time went on, the green tea latte is renamed to be matcha latte, a little more culturally accurate. Um, Chamberlain Coffee is run by People's Choice Award winner and social media influencer Emma Chamberlain and she has a coffee company where she introduced her matcha line to in 2021. Um, marketing off of how expensive Starbucks matcha is, she sells quote ceremonial grade end quote matcha in tins for homemade latte making. Her matcha is branded as vegan, non-GMO, gluten-free, pure plant products made from 100% organic Japanese green tea. And also, it is offered in the flavors mango, vanilla, and chocolate in addition to the original flavor. Um, if that wasn't a mouthful, <laughs> um, Japanese tea ceremony does not concern these buzzwords, nor does it flavor the matcha, as I mentioned before. The point is to savor the bitter but naturally sweet flavor of the matcha and therefore mixing it with uh, such foreign flavors such as chocolate, mango, and vanilla are very non-ceremonial grade despite it being advertised in that way. It seems that though ceremonial grade and these buzzwords are contradictory, um, they are put together for the purpose of marketing this product to American consumers. Third, superfood brands. The nutritious and energizing qualities of matcha qualify it for the classification as a superfood. Um, online sellers advertise their matcha superfood detoxes as jitter-free caffeine. 
matcha is branded to be ceremonial grade, high grade, or even quality, high quality compared to other brands. Um, other selling phrases include from Uji Japan or elevate your morning ritual. It seems in the case of superfood brands, they like it to seem as authentic and as high quality as possible, yet it does not ever acknowledge the Japanese tea ceremony. And in addition to this, superfood brands tend to mix matcha with other um, superfoods such as mushroom or turmeric, and they are branded as ceremonial grade matcha, which feels a little bit wrong and is only marketed this way um, for, for more clicks. So this is another instance of the transculturation of matcha. It certainly does not resemble the tea ceremony, nor does it resemble the original powder. And so my conclusion is that the transculturation of matcha has occurred through a top-down path in the American market. Matcha no longer resembles its traditional purpose or use as a traditional artifact. Now, the implications of this are that as matcha becomes more of a product through the process of transculturation, the marginalized knowledge that matcha carries as a Japanese heritage will disappear not only from the product, but also from the minds of Japanese Americans who are the displaced members of its source culture. UNESCO suggests that tangible cultural heritages such as matcha tea ceremony must be safeguarded to preserve this knowledge. Unless UNESCO begins focusing on the transculturation of such products, tangible cultural heritages will only continue to disappear. If we look at the disappearance of Japanese tea ceremony abroad, we will not know where it went. Observing the changing and diminishing significance of the tea ceremony through the commodification of matcha will provide a clear image of why this tangible heritage is disappearing. Not only would this disappearance be a loss for authentic Japanese representation abroad, but it would be a cultural tragedy for Japanese American identity and traditional Japanese heritage in the United States. Thank you.